Welcome to worship this evening. Welcome to all those who are worshiping online with us. This third midweek Advent service that we're having. We're continuing with the theme of my soul and stillness wait. This week number three's theme is wait for Jesus in sureness. We continue with the opening hymn, hymn number nine, Jesus your church with longing eyes. Please stand. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. light and scatter the darkness.
Lord God, we thank you for this day of grace now drawing to a close. Stay with us and warm our hearts with your forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in time of need that we may sing your praise in holy joy now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We can now continue with the psalm, Psalm 89 found on page 98 in the front part of the hymnal.
Lord God, grant us your Holy Spirit that we may hear and believe your word. Cleanse our minds and renew our hearts that we may live for you here and hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our lesson for this afternoon comes from Isaiah chapter 35. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Everlasting joy will crown their heads, gladness and joy will overtake them, and the sorrow and singing will, sighing will flee away. This is the word of the Lord. A seasonal response. The Lord will come again in glory. The Spirit and the church cry out, come, Lord Jesus, come. We now continue with the next hymn, hymn 703, My Soul in Stillness Waits. As we listen to this, sing this hymn, we prepare our hearts for Christ coming.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our devotion for this evening comes for, is based on Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 52. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like the unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing it. One of the experts uh, in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, Woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be helped, held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been and shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering." This is the gospel of the Lord. Everybody wants a sure thing in this life. Maybe you're going and you're going to go get a new gadget or new, something new, some new thing for your home, and you do a whole lot of research before you buy that object. The reason why you're doing all that research is you want to be sure that whatever that is you're getting is going to work. People want to be sure about what they get. People who gamble want to be sure that their bet is going to get them money, even though gambling in itself lends itself to say, well, there, you can't be sure about anything. Business people want to be sure about the, about the business decisions that they're going to be making, that it's going to benefit their company. And even, well, these days, as we're thinking about gifts for others, we want to be sure that the gift we get is going to be good. That we want to be sure that the gift that we're going to get, the person when they receive it is going to be super happy and excited to receive it. So we might be taking notes, looking for hints here and there to be sure we get the right gift. There's something else that people on this earth want to be sure about. They want to be sure about where they're going after they die. Before so many, they're not sure. They're not sure because they don't know what comes after, or they're not sure because they're, working, they're relying on their works to gain their salvation. They have no sureness in this life. But for us Christians, we do have sureness. Sureness in Jesus Christ. Sureness that Jesus has won our salvation. So we wait for Jesus in sureness. Our devotion text for today, it finds Jesus talking with some Pharisees. And after he's talking, a Pharisee invites him to go and have dinner with him. Seems like a nice gesture to have for Jesus, but really we begin to see as we look through this that they have bad intentions. They're looking for some dirt to get on Jesus, to find something to point to him to say, hey, look, you've messed up here. You're not as good, you're not as perfect as you say you are. Well, very, very shortly into that meal, we find that it looks like the Pharisees have what they're looking for. Jesus didn't wash himself before they ate. 
They never voiced any of this out loud, but we just hear that the one Pharisee was surprised that Jesus didn't do this. Jesus, knowing all things, being God, was able to know what his thoughts were and then turned to him and began to rebuke him and the other Pharisees. And here we see the start of the six woes that Jesus brings to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The first ones were brought to the Pharisees where he starts pronouncing woe on them because they are a people who like to seem religious. They like to do everything on the outside to seem really great and good, but on the inside they're really rejecting God's word. They're seeking their own fame, their own fortune, their own glory instead of God's. Pushing God's word back to the side and stomping on people who get in their way. As Jesus was saying these words to the Pharisees, we see some of the teachers of the law begin to pipe up. They're almost going to Jesus and saying, well, hold on, Jesus. Look, you're, you're insulting us too with these words. Whatever motivation they had, we see Jesus turning to them and not saying, okay, well, that's all right for you guys. No, he turns to them and begins to rebuke them also. Rebuke them for what they are doing. And he brings up a point of apparently they, were bring, they are building tombs for those prophets that had died long ago. Prophets that the Jews had killed. And Jesus brings up the point of you are no better than those people who killed these prophets, even though you think you are, because you're rejecting God and his word. He even brings up the fact that they're not done, they're not done killing the prophets. That very soon they, they will be killing Jesus and they killed John the Baptist also. He points out that they're not fooling anyone with this. They're not fooling God at all. But they still lack that, that belief in him and they're still rejecting his word and his messengers. What's even worse is these teachers of the law, well, they're called teachers of the law, Right? They should be going and they should be teaching and proclaiming to everybody what the Bible says, what Scripture says, and they should be the ones pointing forward to Jesus as the Messiah and saying, hey, he's here. But instead of doing that, instead of helping the people, we find them leading the people into sin, leading the people into unbelief and putting all these laws and all these even man-made laws on top top of them, weighing them down, pointing forward, pointing them towards their works to gain salvation rather, rather than the salvation Jesus would win. They're not providing their people with any sureness at all. As we see these woes and these rebuke, the rebukes that Jesus brings to the Pharisees and those teachers of the law, we can't help but see ourselves there also. Can't help but see ourselves as hypocrites who know what God's word has to say, but so often go and do the opposite. So often we can go and try to put what God's word has to say and say, well, that applies to others, but it doesn't apply to us. And we can even do that in our minds. Our minds where we can see here where we have so often sinned, but Jesus and God knows our minds. He knew what that Pharisee was thinking, even though he just thought it. He didn't say it out loud. We see here that even our thoughts, we can't hide from God. We can see our hypocrisy. We can see how we're selfish and we love ourselves other rather than others. We can see that just like those Pharisees and those Sadducees, those Pharisees and those teachers of the law, we so often don't put God first above everything else but other things. And so often in our lives we're not humble but like to promote ourselves. Maybe even using our, our, our faith in Jesus and using the Bible and saying we follow these things as a bragging point, not to give glory to God, but to give glory to ourselves. So we see all these things, how we can be just like those Pharisees and those teachers of the law. We can see that the door to heaven should be shut for us. For us here on this earth, the only thing that should be sure for us is that we're going to be damned into hell forever. But as we read through this section, we can see God's grace and love here. Grace and love for the people. Grace and love for those Pharisees and those teachers of the law. As he was saying these woes, he was warning them to repent, turn back from where you are. And he says the same for us. But we also see Jesus working for our salvation here. 
We see Jesus working for our salvation in his whole life. As we look forward to Christmas and Jesus' first coming, we look forward for him coming, and that's when he starts to live that perfect life in our place. A perfect life where he was never a hypocrite. He always put others first. He always put God and his will first. And he was always humble in his service. Where we hear the Bible saying, he being in, the, in his very nature, God did not seek equality with God, something to be grasped. He was always serving others, serving his Lord and Savior perfectly in our place. You see Jesus here as the key to our salvation. The key that those, those Pharisees and those teachers of the law were rejecting. He's the key because he did everything for us. You see, those Pharisees, those teachers of the law, that washing that they thought they got Jesus on, well, that washing that they thought they said, oh, we got him now, that particular washing was one that was man-made. It was one of their made-up rules. It wasn't one of the rules in the Old Testament. But as we look at the Old Testament, we see all those different rules for washing, different rules for, for sacrifices, which were meant to constantly point forward to the need of a Savior. They were meant to show the person that you are lost in sin. You need someone else. They were meant to point forward to Christ. And as we look at Jesus here in our reading, as we look at Jesus in his whole life, we can see the one who was perfect, who needed no washing, who was never hypocritical, who loved others and loved God first. He was pierced. He was bruised, he was bloodied, he was stained with our sins in our place. And then he gave you and I the ultimate washing. The washing in his blood. He is the key to our salvation. He is the key to our sureness. He is the reason why we can wait in sureness for his coming. And we can wait in sureness for, for our eternity and forgiveness forever in heaven. All because of Christ's saving work. That's what those Pharisees, that's what those teachers of the law were missing. They were rejecting Jesus as the key. The key to the Old Testament, what the Old Testament was pointing forward to. They lacked, their, lacked faith in him and they didn't see it. Through the eyes of faith, we can see Jesus as the key. The key to our salvation. The key to heaven. Because of that, heaven's gates are flung wide open to us. We can be sure of our salvation in everything that we do. Every single day. So this Advent season, as we wait to celebrate that first coming of Jesus, Jesus we can wait in sureness. Sureness of his coming that when he came, he lived the perfect life for us, did everything that was needed to win our salvation. And we can also wait in sureness. Sureness for him to come again on the last day in victory and triumph. Sureness that he has kept, that God has kept all his promises. We can be sure every day that we will be one day in heaven with Jesus. So wait for Jesus and sure and sureness amen we continue with singing the song of mary
the part of service where the service where we remember our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. If you brought an offering this evening, I invite you to place it in the slot at the back and in front of church. You can also give online through Realm or drop it off at the office. We continue with the prayers. Please stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you so graciously sent to earth and offered as the Lamb of sacrifice for our sins. Holy Jesus, true Son of God, we thank you for demonstrating God's love for us by coming here as our brother to die for our sins on the cross. As we return in, in, return in spirit to Bethlehem's stable, where you first appeared in human flesh to be our Savior, Lend us your grace to rededicate ourselves in thoughts, words, and deeds to you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us the faith of John the Baptist, which believes and confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior of the world. Give us true joy and peace in believing. And we continue in the prayer that our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We join in Luther's evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously had me this day. Forgive me all my sins, and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the faith with the foe may have no power over me. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, the peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn, hymn number 21, Hosanna to the coming Lord.
Good evening. It's great to have you all in worship this evening. Just a couple of announcements, just a reminder that this, this coming Friday and then Sunday is going to be our, our children's service then. So once again, we're just promoting that Friday 9 a.m. service where we'd like to have try to get more people there to that one because we were thinking that one's going to be one that's going to be less filled. And also the stewardship meeting is today at 5 p.m. between the services. May the Lord bless the rest of your week.